Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after loss. On today's show, we'll talk to author Eileen Doyon about her book series called Unforgettable Faces and Stories. She started writing to cope after losing her dad to lung cancer in 2011 and turned her solo healing practice into a book series and a community for others who have also lost loved ones. Also on the show today, a listener says she is unable to cry after the loss of her brother. And I'll talk about going home after grief. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide who speaks, writes, and teaches the transformational power of grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to equip others with the knowledge to heal and remind them that they are not alone. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. I was home this past weekend in North Carolina, and I put up an Instagram post about what it feels like to go home after loss. It seemed to resonate with a lot of people, so I wanted to expand on it for the top of the show this week. Anyone who has ever lost anyone knows what homelessness feels like. And I'm not talking about living on the streets. I'm not talking about being without the physical structure of a home. I'm talking about the feeling of being without a home. A feeling that's consistent and safe and secure and always there. A feeling of having somewhere to go back to. When we experience loss, especially the loss of a family member or a friend that was part of home for us, that feeling of home practically just disappears overnight, and you are suddenly homeless. Home is a lot of things for us. It's a place, it's a collection of people, it's even a reference point in our lives, both on our mental timelines and even geographically, our spot within the world. So it's really, really hard when we're suddenly forced to reframe not just the physical aspects of our home, who's died and who's not, and what's inside and outside the structure of the home, and if we or our relatives sell the home and move somewhere else, but when we actually have to reckon with losing the feeling of home that no matter how many more people we cram through the front door and no matter how hard we try to superglue every piece of furniture in place, we cannot recreate or recapture our feeling of home once it's gone. We cannot bring our old feelings of home back. I remember I came home from college uh, about two or three months after my mom died. It was still winter, and I remember walking from the garage into the house and literally just just losing my breath. I could hear my mom's voice practically screaming in my head, what happened? Everything was in disarray. There were piles of papers and magazines and newspapers all over the tables and counters. There were towels and sheets that had been strung up over the windows and nothing had been dusted a while. And and just so much sensory information hit me at once. My mom was gone. My house was different. My dad was not my mom. My mom did all the cleaning and organizing for the house. I couldn't even feel her anymore. All the rooms seemed dark. When did we start subscribing to this magazine? Who put stuff in my room? How am I going to live with this? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. She's not here. And walking into that house for the first time after she died, it was like grieving her all over again. And every room that I went into was a reminder that my mom's physical presence was no longer a part of what the rest of my family kept calling our house. It didn't feel like home to me anymore, and I couldn't bring any of those old home feelings back. It was another part of grief that I just didn't expect, and it was totally heartbreaking and totally flattening. On my Instagram, I talked about each trip home being a combination of greetings and goodbyes. That when you return home again after you've lost someone, you say hello to all the things that have risen up in place of what used to be there. And you have to say goodbye to everything you lost and are continuing to lose. There is absolutely no way No way that everything that is a part of your home now can replace who you lost. But in grief, you don't really have a choice about life continuing on. It just does. People have babies and adopt pets and get boyfriends or girlfriends or switch jobs or get haircuts or buy new furniture. New pictures go up on the wall and on the fridge. 
new smells float through the house, new events and new memories are made. And going home again after loss, you say hello to all of that, whether you want to or not. And also with grief, you don't say goodbye just once. You say goodbye over and over and over again. The first time I came home again after my mom died, I said goodbye to my mom again. But I also said goodbye to her way of organization and the way that my room used to look before she died. In saying goodbye, you say goodbye to someone's voice and their mannerisms and their stuff and their cars and their clothes and their touch and their habits and their foods being kept in the kitchen. Their handwriting doesn't show up on post-it notes around the house anymore. Their friends don't come by as often. And the flowers that they planted this year won't be coming back next year. Going home, you say goodbye to all of that. Again, whether you want to or not. And each time you visit home, you acknowledge or say hello to what's new, the things that have changed. And you acknowledge or say goodbye to the things that aren't there anymore. Everything that seems to have disappeared. And inevitably, inevitably... Inevitably, your feelings of home and your feelings towards home become something else. They change. And that's, that's just how grief works. I imagine it's different if you're constantly living in the home where your loved one used to live. For lack of better phrasing, you're marinating in that homelessness feeling. You're there every day as things are changing. In a way, you might have more input and exposure to everything that's happening, but it's still different. And without your loved one there, it doesn't feel like home anymore. And probably some days it feels like you have nowhere else to go. I get the experience of coming back intermittently. I almost called it a luxury, the luxury of coming back intermittently, but no. Especially in the beginning, it didn't feel that way. Coming home for me felt harsh and shocking and overwhelming to step back into my house again after my mom was gone. But in another frame of mind, I've also gotten the chance to create a new home for myself up in Chicago. So I had a space that was all my own, while what I used to call home was in a state of change or upheaval or flux. And that was just a different experience is all. Our homes, our physical spaces, and our feelings of home can change In the blink of an eye, grief growers, death can trigger feelings of homelessness, but so can divorce or a breakup or an instance or a worsening of abuse or assault or a diagnosis that brings its literal modifications to our homes and our spaces. And homelessness, this feeling of homelessness can happen at any age. So many things can make home feel not like home anymore. If you are in it, Right now, my hearts, I am sorry. We don't expect to lose our feelings of home and grief, but when we do, there's just one more thing that we have to add to the pile of things to mourn. Things that we will never get back. And it hurts. And I'm sorry. And I love you. If you're coming out of it right now, grief growers, if your idea of home is restabilizing into a new iteration, a new evolution, of home, with additions and subtractions and unexpected modifications, and you're starting to feel okay with it, I'm really proud of you. You've said hello and goodbye to a lot of things over time, things that you have wanted to and haven't wanted to, and with the work of your awareness, and and all of that takes courage and lots and lots of emotional heavy lifting, and you're doing it. I love you. And if you're staring loss in the face, if you're staring it down, if that feeling of homelessness hasn't set in yet, but you know it's going to, you've got a death coming or a divorce pending or another anticipatory loss that's just looming on the horizon, go ahead just right now in a small way today, just add that home feeling to the list of things that you're going to lose. This is not a punishment or a gimmick on my end to get you to start grieving before you're ready, but it's just an awareness thing. So that way, when the home feeling is gone, you won't be struck with such a feeling of shock or of overwhelm. It will be hard, but it'll be a reluctant, possibly angry, possibly tragic, ah, yeah, there it is. Home is gone. I see you, and I love you, and I'm here for you through this. Home is a unique and special relationship for each of us, my grief growers. 
And I'm curious to know this week, what home or homes have you lost in the process of losing loved ones? How has home changed for you through grief? What do you think of home now versus what you thought of home then? You can join me live this Monday, November 6th on Facebook at one o'clock central time to talk more about grief and facing this feeling of being without a home. You can find my Facebook page at Shelby Persithia Intuitive Grief Guide. Next up, I'll answer a listener question about not being able to cry after a loss. Casey says, My brother passed away six months ago. He was 30 years old and my only sibling, and I just can't seem to cry. I used to cry, like I used to cry at work when things got stressful or I would cry when I would fight with my friends or any time I was frustrated. But when he died, I didn't cry at the hospital. I didn't cry at the funeral home. I didn't cry at his memorial. Six months later, and I can't seem to shed a single tear over losing him. I get misty-eyed, but something in me seems to shut it off. I just feel numb. I always thought that if I lost a member of my family, I would go crazy and start crying and shrieking. But my brother dies suddenly and, and no tears. I do feel awful and sad and I miss him every single day. I think I might be blocking out the fact that he's gone, but I'm not sure about that. I just find it really strange that I won't cry. I worry later that I'll have some kind of nervous breakdown over all of this. Okay, so... I have so much to say about tears and crying in grief. First off, Casey, I am so sorry for the sudden loss of your brother. It sounds to me like you're still really shocked that his death happened at all. And while shock doesn't keep you from feeling other feelings, sometimes it's your brain's way of only allowing in specific emotions. And then as your brain sees that you're continuing to live and continuing to function through the weeks and the months after a loss, you can quote unquote unlock more feelings to feel about the loss. Uh, The book Motherless Daughters has a bit about this in its section on sudden death that in cases of sudden or tragic loss, our body and our minds kind of gives us as much as we can emotionally and mentally handle when a loss first happens and then kind of kind of slow releases the rest of our grief over time. So please know, first off, that you're not broken and you're not crazy for not crying, especially in sudden death there's a big trend towards feeling numbness before and in place of any other emotion. That being said, I noted in your note that you switched from the phrase can't cry to won't cry. Uh, You don't say much about your family or your upbringing, but I'm wondering if crying was seen as hysterical or crazy or possibly weak in your family. You use the phrase shrieking and having a nervous breakdown, so I'm wondering what you were taught about tears and emotions growing up that maybe crying was bad or weak or would cause you to literally go out of your mind. The grief recovery method lists don't cry as one of the big six grief myths, which I talked about at a lot of length, actually, in episode five of Coming Back. Basically, we're taught, even as babies and toddlers, that crying is not okay, that it's better for everyone if we don't cry, and that we can substitute other behaviors like hitting, eating, sucking it up, being alone, or distracting ourselves as substitutes for a good cry. These teachings from both our parents and society in general turn us into adults that fear tears or perceive tears as bad, and we're willing to hit or eat or stifle ourselves or drink or get lost in fantasy worlds of TV or video games instead of facing our emotions. If you grew up in a household where you were explicitly told not to cry, don't cry, or were punished for crying, And or if you never saw your parents cry, this may be where a block to crying lies for you and you might just now be stumbling upon it because of this loss. And that's worth exploring with a grief recovery specialist, which you can actually find by going to griefrecoverymethod.com. A counselor or a therapist would also be able to walk you through that limiting belief. One last thing I'll say about tears and grief, and I absolutely love this. The first time I heard it, I was hooked and I've been repeating it to anybody I talk to about crying in grief, and that is, it is impossible to cry forever. There is no way you'll cry forever. It's physiologically impossible to cry and cry and cry and cry for the rest of your life. It's never happened. Crying is one of those things that's kind of like life where you're guaranteed an ending. 
There's a beginning to tears coming on. There's a middle part of the crying. And then there's always an end to the crying. Always. So whatever you need to do to open the floodgates, you can do it knowing that the tears will stop. A lot of people have this fear of if I start crying, I won't be able to stop. And I can tell you that it's impossible. It's not real. I'll tell you, actually, for this question, I googled, I tried to find a world record for time crying. And all I found was a couple of parodies and a few actual world records for amount of people crying while watching sad movies, like they got 70 people together. And they had a world record for the amount of people crying during a movie. And there was one really bizarre record for the amount of time spent crying while eating baby corn. And I was like, I don't know where (laughs) that comes from. Um, But but it just doesn't happen. We don't start crying and don't stop. It's not like those people who have hiccups for eight years. There's a start, there's a middle, and there's an end to tears. So turn on a sad movie, eat baby corn or another food with an emotional tie to your brother. You can smell or wear his clothes or look at old photos of the two of you together, listen to his favorite songs or your favorite songs or sad songs Read a book with a really terribly heart-wrenching ending is a great way to start tears. I mean, even even just starting to sing or scream or just even starting to vocalize or hum in the back of your throat, that's actually how I start to cry. I always kind of start off with yelling or screaming or humming, and then tears come after that. There are a lot of ways, a lot of possibilities to unlock tears in your world. So just see what comes. Biggest takeaways for you today, Casey, and with this question, one, you are not broken. It is 100% normal to feel numbness first, especially after a sudden loss, and to not cry. That being said, you might be. If you've got a hunch, you might be blocking your brother's death or tears in general because you're afraid to address them, and that has to do with childhood and our societal pressures about the badness and goodness of tears. So I would definitely look into that with a grief recovery specialist or a therapist in your area. And lastly, just as a bit of reassurance, as point three, when you do start crying, know that you will not cry forever. Your tears will start and your tears will end. I have so much love for you. If you're looking for a safe space to talk about crying or not crying, or share some more tips on tears, please join my private Facebook group, The Grief Growers Garden. You can ask your own question to be featured on the podcast by leaving a voicemail or texting 312-725-3043 or emailing shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. You can find both of these contacts and a link to the Facebook group in the show notes. Next up, we'll talk to Eileen Doyan about the loss of her mom, brother, and father, and how all of her losses led her to writing and publishing the grief stories of others. Eileen Doyan created her book series Unforgettable Faces and Stories after her dad's death from lung cancer in 2011. She has created an international community of readers and storytellers that live by the motto, Your Story Told by You. Each book gives grievers an opportunity to tell their story around a particular theme, and through their writing, they heal themselves, inspire others, and get published, perhaps for the very first time. Eileen has been featured on many radio shows and podcasts and is currently being featured weekly on mondayswementor.com. Well, Eileen, welcome to the show today. I am so excited to have you here to share your story with us and how that has created space for others to share stories as well. I would love to start off where we start off all of our podcast episodes and have you tell us your lost story. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Shelby, for inviting me. I'm very excited. In regards to my loss, uh, I'm going to go back real quick. Uh, 1981, I lost my mom in July, and then four months later, I lost my brother. And, um, I was 23 at the time and I was just getting started in my career. Your mom isn't supposed to die when you're 23, let alone your brother. And what I actually did is I just dove into my career. I didn't take time to grieve. I wasn't taught how to grieve. I was just into my career, traveled a lot, and then was making my life. And then in 2013, speeding years ahead, I lost my uh, dad to lung cancer. And I was with my dad, Shelby, until the end. And that uh, really impacted 
with my life. It was a very dark and depressing time. And I think not grieving prior of my mom and my brother and then losing my father, who I loved dearly, and I cry every time I, I talk about him, it just really pushed me over the edge, if you will, into a very dark time of my life. That makes total sense to me. And there's this teaching in the grief recovery method that says grief is cumulative, especially if you don't, how do I phrase this, like address it in the first go around. Right. So what was different about your experience with your father that that was when you experienced grief? Was it a different relationship that you had with him? Or it was just so much overload that you're like, I can't do the career jumping into a career again, I have to grieve this time. I think a lot of multiple things. Uh, No one teaches us, Shelby, how to grieve. And like I said, I was 23 years old, and that just never happened to anyone that I knew in my inner circle, if you will. I was the first one in my friend's circle that lost their mom. And and I don't think other, my friends didn't know what to say to me. They, no one teaches you how to grieve or how to help grieving people back then in the early 80s, like today, because we have the internet and it's so much different now, Shelby. It, it just is. And then losing my brother, it just, it, nothing was making sense. And I don't think I knew what to do. And, and as I mentioned, I was, you know, starting out in my career on a high, you know, traveling and doing this and doing that, that I never took time to grieve, that I just kept busy and never took the time. I was with my father to the end. And I, for anyone that has lost anyone due to cancer, it was horrific. You know, my father, because of the situation, we were very close. I was always daddy's little girl, if you will, anyways. But, you know, because it was him and I, basically, you know, he had had a stroke earlier in 2009, had bladder cancer, and, you know, I, I live in New Hampshire. My dad was in New York and I was going back and forth, you know, to New York all the time when he was really sick. And, um, and then when we had found out when he had lung cancer, but to watch someone that you love dearly just die in, in front of you and experience that whole death route, which, you know, I know that you have had, it's just so different because of the relationship, because I think you're so involved in taking care of that person, taking care of and doing everything for that person from start to finish with with their whole remainder of their life. And then all of a sudden they're gone and you're like, oh my God, they're gone. What do I do? How do I act? How do I heal? How do I have fun again? How do I pick up the pieces and make something of my life? When you don't want to because you don't want to have fun, you, you're missing that person so deeply. So I think I was at a different time in my life as well. You know, obviously I was in my late fifties when I lost my dad. I was uh, like fifty-two, I, I guess, and so I changed because I I had been growing. You know, you you grow from twenty-three to fifty-three. You've got all this life experience now, and you know what the career wasn't as important as it was when I was 23 to 53. You know, I think we all evolve and we all change. And I think that that's sometimes why, and this is in my own opinion, people handle death differently because of the stage that they're, that they are in their life. Ooh, can you speak more on that idea? We have ups and down peaks and valleys all our life. Just going back a little further in, in 63, my mom was involved in a fire and I was standing right in front of my mom and a lighter fluid actually exploded in her hand for whatever reasons. And I was right there and I watched it and I was six years old and I never talked about what actually happened until I actually wrote a story about my mom in one of my books, which we can talk about later. But, you know, what does a six-year-old kid know about anything? And, you know, if that had happened when I was 23, obviously it would have affected me differently or 30 or 40 because we are just at different points in our life. And I think that it's just, in my opinion, I think it's more challenging and more difficult the older we are when we lose our immediate family members because I think we know or realize how precious life and family is. Whereas when we just starting out in our career, you know, especially in the eighties, that was a whole different era, if you will. And it was a whole different generation. And I just unfortunately never took the time to grieve, didn't know what it was, didn't know how to act. And it's just so different now. Have you grieved your mom and your brother since then? 
I don't know. I think that um, they were part of the, the dark area in my life after my father died, because I think I realized, like, all of a sudden, I have no, I have no immediate family. And I think it made it more empty because my mom and my brother were still, I have a, a niece. She was eight when my brother died and uh, her parents were divorced and my husband and I are very close to her because of that situation. And, you know, I think that my dad and I, you're always, we were family. We were doing Christmases and Thanksgiving and, you know, I would, I would, do all fun stuff. I mean, I would buy myself a birthday card for my father and give it to my father to sign it and he'd get a kick out of it. And then we'd put it in the mail and, you know, just do goofy stuff like that and, you know, celebrate Christmas and Easter and the holidays. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you have all those family memories and they're all stripped away because, you know, my husband and I have been married since 1982, but it's just different. It's just different to all of a sudden not have your family, your immediate family with you anymore at all. It's, it's a very lonely feeling that you have to adjust to. So what did that adjustment look like for you? What changed about your work, your career, your relationship with your husband, maybe with friends or extended family after you lost him? Everything changed. I, um, after my dad died, I knew I was smart enough to know that I was in not in a good place. It was very depressing. It was very dark. I just didn't know what to do. I felt like I was just kind of fumbling around, you know, doing this and doing that. And I was aching inside and I knew I had to do something. So what did I do is I went to Google and I did a, did a Google search and it said to write. And I started writing something uh, every day in a book, in a notebook. And then after two weeks, I said, well, this isn't working. It's just because of my personality. It just wasn't enough for me to do. And then I, I came across, you know, to write a book. And I was like, and it gave like a spark in front of me. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to write a book about my dad. And, you know, uh, he was in the, in, the, in the military when he fought in World War II. You know, his boot hit Iwo Jima when he was 17 years young, Shelby. And you know, I could talk a, a lot about that. But I was thinking, oh, my God, I can do this for my dad. So it was kind of like turning that dark, non-purpose feeling into a purpose. But it was for my dad's honor. And that kind of gave me a spark. And that's what I did. And that's how I started turning my, I think we have to use, or I'm speaking for myself, I had to use that darkness and loneliness and turn it into a positive energy. And I think that we all have to find what that positive energy is, whether if you, um, you know, doing charity work or doing you know, work with military or, or whatever. I think we have to find something, Shelby, where we can take that darkness because it's so easy to slip back into that dark. There's this whole phenomenon that we, um, that we talk about in our society of no matter when you lose your parents, it's still that I have no immediate family left. I have no family. And it's, it's this really, it's this really deep story that's ingrained in all of us that, oh my God, I have no one. I am alone. I have been abandoned. This is, I am, I am alone in the whole world. So to start using writing as a way to not even to fix this, because I never really like using the word fix with grief, but to start addressing this feeling of, of what can I do with myself at this point to both keep these memories alive and to keep myself alive through this loss is just really incredible. I do want to transition now into the things that helped you come back. It sounds like writing was very, very instrumental for you, but were there other other resources, other maybe movies or bloggers or family or friends that helped you come back from this loss in a specific way? I think all of the above, and I'll tell you why. When I decided to, to write a book, I, I said to my husband, and my husband's been fabulous during this whole whole process. But I said to my husband, I'm going to write a book about my dad. And he's like, okay. And of course, I've never had any inclination about writing a book 
before in my life. And it's funny because my father, I used to ask my father questions, you know, oh, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he'd say, oh, what are you writing me a book? And I'd say, yes, I'm on chapter three, page 25, whatever that happened. We'd laugh. <laughs> and now it, it's almost Shelby, like when I look back and I'm like, oh my God, that maybe has been my path all along. But I said to Danny, I said, you know, I'm going to write a book about my father. And then I looked at Danny and I said, no one's going to read that book except for me. And then you out of courtesy. And he just laughed. And then I said, you know what? If I feel this way, Danny, there's got to be other women out there that feel this about their dads that have lost their dads. And what I did is I said, I'm going to do a tribute and a dedication to my father in a book. And I'm going to reach out to my friends that I went to school with because most of our dads were fought in World War II all around the same age, where they can do a tribute about their dad as well. And the reason I, I say that is because I had to do research. I had to go out and I had to to call my friends and use social media to connect with my friends and say, gee, you know, this is what I'm doing. Would you like to do that? So I networked. I used social media. You know, I went to blogs to find out information about writing books. So I just went I mean, I would stay up till one in the morning and, and do research. And this isn't kudos for me. This is just, again, taking all that energy and putting it towards something. So when you're talking about resources, I just looked for everything. And then I, you know, looked on how to write a book, what to do, do this. And then I went into, I actually self-published, um, used a self-publisher for my first four books. And now I do my books on my own. But, you know, so I had to do all the searching. I had to do, you know, internet searches about self-publishers, what they did, what they didn't do, what this meant, what in marketing. And, and then I had to, you know, find out information. So I used it all, anything I could find and get my hands on Shelby, I used. And where was your dad in this process or even your mom or your brother? Where were they sitting uh, in your heart with this? I think I was so, this might sound a little selfish on my mom's and my brother's side. I think I was so focused about my dad because it hit me and I was with him and, and saw him pass. I, I, it was all about focusing on my father, my father, my father. And then what happened is right around the same time I inherited my grandmother's chandelier, my uncle was diagnosed with lung cancer at the same time my dad was, and he was younger. And, um, and he passed as well. And I inherited her chandelier that we used to, you know, hang over our dining room tables. And I can still see everyone sat in the same seat. They practically wore the same clothes every <laughs> holiday, you know, and things like that. And so I started to open up about other family members' deaths, including my mom's more and then my brother's. Then I I got so much feedback when I released my first two books that I decided to do a series. I said to Danny, well, I'm getting so much feedback and encouragement from people of how it made them feel, that it helped and heal them and inspire them. And I said, I really think I have something here. So I created a website. But then what I did is I ended up writing a story about my mom in one of my books because I was ready to talk about my mom. I was ready to to dig into my heart and grieve for her and talk about her. Because even my even when she got burnt in the fire, my my husband really never knew what what happened, and uh, it was the first time in his life that he ever read really what happened was when my book came out, and you know talking about my brother. So I I think that it started with my dad because it was so new and and deep, and I talk about my grandmother, my father's mom that died when my dad was three months old. I did all this research about her on Ancestry.com and found out a lot of information about her where I wrote a story about her in one of my books. So it's almost, you know, I'm healing little by little, piece by piece, story by story. Oh, I love how you phrase that because I think that's so true for all of us. And there's this societal expectation that we're supposed to heal from grief immediately and all at once. And people forget that grief is this continuing, it's like a continuing saga, almost like a soap opera of doing it episode by episode, story by story. And every every new 
line that you connect with the past or with something that's happening now that would connect with a loss, it just heals a little bit more. It's something that heals not just with time, because time does not heal all, but with focused attention and and putting your heart into it. I can't really phrase it better than that. But I, I definitely want to talk about the first book that you that you wrote and had published. Uh, were you afraid? What was the reception like? Where did you market it? What what reviews came in? I'm kind of very curious about how how you launched this into the world and how it was received. My first book with dedication, Dads and Daughters, uh, that I did, I only had around 13 stories, 13 people. What I do is I uh, compile stories from other people into a book. So I have each person write a, a story about the theme of my book, which this one was Dedication, Dads and Daughters. And, you, you know, I had mentioned earlier that I reached out to women that I went to school with because our dads were around the same age. And, you know, uh, my one friend said, oh, my God, Eileen, she said, I had all this information about my dad about the war, but it was scattered all over the place, like most of our information about our family is uh, to a certain extent. And she said, you made me put everything together. And now I can give this to my grandkids. I can give this to my, oh. my family members and say, here, read this tribute about, you know, your grandfather, your dad. And she said, what an incredible feeling. And, and most of the women, that's what it was. We, I, I never knew, Shelby, I'm embarrassed to say this. I never knew my father fought in Iwo Jima. I always knew that he was in World War II, but they, the greatest generation, they never talked about the war. You know, and I found out going through uh, things of my dad's, uh, you know, a couple few months before he died, that he was in Iwo Jima. And it just, it kills me to have known. And he was there 36 days. The war was supposed to be over in 48 hours, and it lasted th about 36 to 38 days. And my dad fought there um, most of the battle when he was 17. I think that because of how... It made my friends feel, these women feel, they, they, their feedback was incredible. And then uh, my second book, Keepsakes, Treasures from the Heart, I had men and women talk about things that they have from someone that passed. You know, it might be a Christmas ornament. It was like a, a plate where one of their friends discovered she had this rare cancer and she um, only had 12 weeks to live. And she bought the, her five closest friends this plate with a saying on it. And gave that to each of them as a memory because she wanted them to have happy memories of her. And just all these things came out. And I'm like, oh, my God, this this is just something. I think that everyone has a story to tell, everyday people. And I think that I can do a theme and have people contribute stories to help them, help them heal and help to inspire other people, Shelby for whatever we do in life because the you know this thing called life has peaks and valleys it's not an easy ride it has bumps and turns and dirt roads and major highways sometimes and if we can if i can help people feel better about their life and feel better about a person in their life isn't that a great thing yeah that is such a gift too and for for your desire to heal to become something that can crack open those stories and that healing in others is really, really powerful. Kind of like uh, I'm getting an image of like a ripple effect. Right, exactly. Among you and your friends and your authors and writers. So how did you actually decide to create your your title, Unforgettable Faces and Stories? Did you Did you start that before you published the book or did you say, I'm doing a lot of these, so I may as well make it a continuing uh, project? Well, it was really funny because I told you, you know, here I am. I, I have a lot of energy, which you can probably tell, which you have a lot of energy as well. So I was, I was doing the two books actually to kind of together. And, you know, I was doing the stories and getting everything done and didn't have a clue. I was working with this person that was a self publisher and he's just, you know, he must have thought, oh my God, here I have this person that's doing two books, never done anything before in her life, because it was funny. When I first went to him, I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do these two books. And he says, okay, well, this is what you have to do. And he gave me a list. And he says, once you have all this information together, come see me the first of the year. Well, January 2nd, I basically knocked on his door and I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, oh my God, you never thought I was going to do this, did you? And he said, no, most people don't. And I said, well, he never... didn't think you were going to show up. Yeah. He said, most people, oh my goodness. 
I said, well, you know what, Justin, you never worked with me. And I can tell you right now, when I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. But most people want to write a book, Shelby, at some point in their life. And most people don't because they just don't know what to do. And it's just a fun thing to say sometimes. Oh, my life, everyone tells me I should write a book, but they don't. But anyways, so I'm doing this. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting all this feedback from people before the books are published and uh, before the covers are done. And then I said, oh, my God, Danny, I want to do a series. And it, my husband was so whatever you want to do type of a thing because he knew I was in a bad place. So I had, to, you know, in doing the cover, my self-publisher said, look, you've got to hurry up and come up with a name because we're doing titles. So Unforgettable Faces and Stories popped in because I wanted something that would be an umbrella of any topic that I could put an, underneath there. So Unforgettable Faces and Stories Dedication Dads and Daughters was the title of my book. So Unforgettable Faces and Stories is really my series name. And then I have different titles for each of the books. So it all happened so quick. I, I When I think back to what I did, I, I say to Danny sometimes, wow, I, I really kind of did a lot of things. And he looks at me and he says, you're kidding me, right? And But it just everything just kept falling into place like it was supposed to happen. Wow, that's so phenomenal. And I just I just love that this project's become so big and that you've had so much faith and drive towards it throughout this whole process. You're like this is what this is what will help. This is what's helping me come back, so why not continue to do that? Exactly. Oh, how cool. Oh, how cool. So I'm curious now. You've mentioned your husband a couple times. I wonder um what his influence has been on your life and on your grief, because you have described him so far as a very supportive person of your work. He, uh, he has been very supportive. He, he didn't, he only met my mom a couple of times before she passed. And with my dad, my dad li lived with us through the years. And, you know, and because my, he, and he, my dad used to visit us. And when I'd go home to New York, we it was always centered around my father. You know, it was always, I was going to do this. We're going to do this. And, um, Everyone loved my father. Danny loved them. They had a great relationship. And um, so he would, we're very supportive of each other. And I think that that's what makes it work. That's why we've been together since 1982. And uh, so he would have supported anything to have helped me as I would him if I knew it was going to help him. It's It's funny. Well, it's not funny, but Last year, his mom was diagnosed with bone cancer uh, two Christmases ago, and they only gave her less than a year to live. And even though he saw me go through what I did with my dad and losing my dad, it helped him a little bit prepare for his mother's death, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. it, it, he thought he knew what to expect. But until it happens actually to you and how you're going to accept it and deal with it, it's so different. Everyone grieves differently, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Well, I love hearing that you've had some support and encouragement from him on your end as well in this project. That's important. It's important, and especially to do what I do and how involved. And, you know, he's my biggest promoter. He talks to people and says, oh, you should talk to my wife. And and it's funny, he just uh, met with some people last week. He's self-employed. And he, the gentleman is a detective. But he, he's like, oh, you got to talk to my wife. This is what she was doing. And and then he, the woman said, oh, I wanted to write a book about my life. And he says, you've got to call her. You know, so he's like my biggest cheerleader out there. And, and that <laughs> warms my heart. He's, he's, he's really good about that. I love it. Let's jump into your next book and your upcoming projects as well. I did release my seventh book this year, which was Starting Over Stories of New Beginnings. Oh, you'll love this. I um, This was the first cover I designed myself. The, the, the book prior, I did design the graphics and the pictures and, and what we used in the colors. But this picture of my last book, it just came to my head. And what it, the cover is actually me on the railroad tracks in Fort Edward, New York, where I grew up, and I have my dad's trench coat on and his hat, and I'm walking where you can only see the back of me. There's some people, even my friends, did not realize it was me walking the tracks. The tracks 
split in front of where I'm walking, you know, like which path are you going to take to start over? And my next book, uh, which will be my eighth one, and I'll start really promoting it in January, is going to be tributes and dedications to first responders. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited about that because a couple of reasons. My first book, obviously, Dedication, Dads and Daughters, where we were making tributes to our fathers that were in the war and our fathers were all deceased. But in first responders, I mean, it's such a a huge target that we have to thank these people every day, Shelby, for what they do. And they put their lives on the line for us and they kiss their loved ones goodbye. And they never, of course, we we kiss our loved ones goodbye and we never know if we're going to come home either. I get that piece. But, you know, these people are out on the lines for us, firefighters, military, EMTs, uh, policemen, canine dogs. You know, I I have a whole, I have a book on pet tales and people talk about their service dogs. I could talk about that for 20 minutes and the people that I've met. But I just think it's going to be fabulous because how awesome would it be for a 10-year-old kid to write about looking up to his father or his grandfather that's been a firefighter all the years, how it trickles down in the family. Or, you know, a mom that, you know, writes about their son or their daughter or their husband. And it, there's so much. I just had a 13-year-old that wrote a story in my, my most recent book about a personal situation and how she had to start over at 13 years old because of a personal situation in their family. And how awesome is it for people of any age to write tributes and dedications to people? I think uh, I think that's going to be a very special, special book. I think so too. And I'm laughing as we're getting the sirens over here on my end. <laughs> I heard that. I'm like, oh, did she put that in? It's a perfectly no, timed. No, I did not. Good, Shelby. <laughs> I tell all of my guests I live about two blocks north of a firehouse here in Chicago. So every so often while I'm recording, you'll have the sirens come on. Oh, that's just so cool. That's just so cool. And I love that. That was perfect timing. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yes, you're welcome. I'll say you're welcome, but it's all their fault. Um, But Shelby, that's another, I mean, isn't that a great sign? See, to me, I I think if you are open to, to signs, hearing and seeing, you get signs. That to me was a sign. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm on board with that as well. I kind of want to go in that direction. Talk about signs for you. Uh-huh. Um, do you have signs for your dad? Do you have signs for your I do. your family? Everything that that happens to me, like the writing a book thing, and I never even got that until after the fact. I remember that about what my dad said. And I said to Danny, that's a sign. It's telling me that it's okay, that that's the path that I'm supposed to be. If I find a feather, I take that as a sign that, you know, my dad is here or my mom or, you know, my brother, mostly my my father and and my mom. I, I was really contemplating on what I was doing next and things like that. And I had a dream. And I will tell you, my dad appeared in my dream and he was probably about 40 years old. And I was just crying heavily and see and just say, dad, I want to come with you. I want to come with you. I don't want to go back. And, you know, he, and he, I was reaching up to grab his hand and he said to me, Hart, it's not your time. Your, your job's not done yet. And I take that Shelby as a sign that I am doing the right thing and that my, my project is helping others and I'm not done yet. I get signs from people that I connect with that because we're so, we're two peas in a pod or we're very, we have similar backgrounds, um, military or, or anything. All, everything is a sign to me that it's okay and that I'm doing the right thing. And I tell people that all the time. We'll be talking like you and I, no, it's a sign. That's what, that's what we're doing. It's a sign. I love the idea of being receptive to signs because especially after loss, we're looking for for glimpses of our loved ones anywhere that we can find them. I mean, who cares if we make them up? They're real for us and they they are what is helping us through. Well, Eileen, I'm curious now if you could tell our listeners if they'd like to be contributors to some of your upcoming projects or where they can follow your work. What are some uh, links and resources for further knowledge? 
Great. Thank you. Uh, my books are available on Amazon.com. You can look up my name, Eileen Doyon, or Unforgettable Faces and Stories, and my books will come right up there. And I have a website, UnforgettableFacesAndStories.com, and you can go to that. And I have all my information, reviews of what's coming up, events, and things like that. I have a Facebook page, Unforgettable Faces and Stories, where we post things that are coming. Uh, I'm out there. I'm on Twitter, Faces and Stories, Pinterest, Facebook. Faces and Stories. I do have a YouTube uh, channel as well. Uh, again, Faces and Stories. I'm on Goodreads, uh, LinkedIn. I You can connect with me on LinkedIn by my name, Eileen Doyon, and then I have all my book information on there, Shelby, as well. If you do want to be a participant in my next book, I don't I don't have the name yet, but I, I do have the theme, obviously. Uh, again, it's going to be tributes and dedications to first responders. I am just putting together the outline. I, I give people like just a very brief outline, Shelby, because I really want it to come from their heart. Uh, And I think that it's a very unique, I think writing is very unique. You know, we can post things on Facebook and, and, and things like that. But when you pick up a pen and you start writing, there's something about that that makes it so personable and so deep from your heart. But I, I'm creating a community of readers and storytellers, and I would love each of your guests to participate and to join my mission in my organization or my community of storytellers and, and readers. So this is your chance, everybody. If you've ever wanted to be a writer and you've got a story pressing on your heart about a loved one, I highly, highly encourage you to join Eileen's community of storytellers. Eileen, thank you so much for joining us on Coming Back Today. I've so loved hearing how the power of writing has helped you come back from your loss and even helped others come back from their losses as well. Oh, well, thank you very much, Shelby. It really means a lot. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Eileen Doyan, author of Unforgettable Faces and Stories, for joining us to talk about how writing can be used as a tool for grief recovery and reminding us that grief is different for everyone, even at different ages. Eileen came back by writing and working to publish a book, of course, but also by using Ancestry.com to find out more about her deceased relatives and reaching out to her community to create a network of storytellers. You can find a link to Eileen's website, unforgettablefacesandstories.com, in the show notes where you can find all of her social media profiles and contact information if you're interested in contributing to her next book on first responders. You can also find all of her books on amazon.com. Join me for Facebook Live this coming Monday, November 6th at 1 o'clock Central Time. We'll be talking about grieving our feelings of home and how the idea of home changes after loss. Please subscribe and tell a friend about coming back because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you always to Mr. Addie Goldstein who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby Forsythia, Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Grief Guide Shelby Forsythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. Again, if you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, leave a voicemail or text 312-725-3043 or email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com, subject line, podcast. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you. This podcast is just a little piece of home for me. I see you. I am proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing.